Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special wrap-up edition of our debrief episode of Channel 71 News. Um, throughout the City Council session, we are always meeting over Zoom every week to chat about uh, what's happening in the city, what's happening in the city government. Um, but at the end of every session of City Council, we decide to come together in person to chat about, about the about the entire six months or so of City Council meetings, going over the highs and lows. And this is that episode. Uh, so we're here at James's place. He's been kind enough to uh, share his abode with us. We got some baked goods. We got some tea. Having a little tea party, um, chatting about Waltham. And so, yeah, how is it going to go? We're just going to go over some highs and lows over the past six months in the city and the um, and the city council as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be politics or um, city council. Um, and we're just going to go over that. We'll probably talk a little bit about the election as well that's coming up. Um, and so the past six months, we should talk about the highs and the lows that we've had. Um, I think if I had to throw one out there, just like since we led with that, uh, high is definitely the number of people that have all pulled papers to run for office. It's nice to see so many new faces. And I have a lot of people that I'm very excited for running and a lot of people but all right i am a lot less excited for running on post so that's about where we're at i agree 100 percent um i think in one of my group chats someone said that this year has more uh non-incumbents running than ever in all things history i i pushed back immediately and said that 2017 had more people um but preparing for this i decided to uh uh, to look into that, and what I what I found was that um, in 2017 there were 12 non-incumbents running for ward seats, five non-incumbents running at large, and one non-incumbent running for school committee. Um, in 2023, you have eight non-incumbents running for ward seats, uh, three non-incumbents running for uh, school committee. And six non-incumbents uh, running for uh, at large, seven if you count George. Are we counting George? You probably have to count George. Yeah. You probably have to count George. Okay. So if you count George, um, and you count and you count Paul, which which I guess I am. Yeah, Brasco yeah. and the yeah. the word nine dude Logan. Yeah. No, I'm I know, I'm counting I'm counting right. Rowan as well. So if you count all those people, um, then it is a tie uh, for. Uh, 18 non-incumbents running in 2017, 18 non-incumbents running in 2023. I'm not including Jonathan and Dwayne Champaign uh, because there was, it wasn't a mayoral race in 2017. Um, so for likewise elections, it's tied. But if you're just counting for overall amount of candidates, regardless of position, then 2023 does have more non-incumbents running than any other election in Walton's history. So definitely a high. I'm going to say hi, hi, hi. Uh, very happy about that. Do you guys know why? In 2017, easy. It was the Trump-Bernie effect. Um, that is why there were so many non-incumbents running. You had a lot of like national organizations popping up trying to get people to run for office. Uh, but I think nowadays, there's much less of that. There's much less pushing for people to run for office. It still exists, and it's still more than pre-2017, 2016. But... Is much it's much less despite that uh disproportionately Waltham has many more people running for office than the surrounding cities um uh, can you guess why i don't have an answer oh, i'm just putting in something i don't know it's uh i think that a lot of it a lot of it like energy i've seen is people that have been mobilized by like how difficult it is to rent in the city and like we'll know you can see just from looking at it like the Price to rent versus like what the average in income is, and uh, the reaction to the the reaction to the the notification ordinance, but also the the energy behind the notification ordinance, like that, that's people energized on both sides. And I think that there's just things are a little bit more tense here for whatever reason. Yeah, I think everyone is understanding that just the just the standard of living is just going down everywhere. And um, for a lot of people anyway, I guess, I shouldn't say everyone, some people are sure, certainly doing fine, but for a majority of people, uh, things are costing more and wages aren't going up. And so people are getting frustrated. And so I think that definitely has something to do with it. 
uh, I think people are just kind of dissatisfied with the, with the trajectory of the city. Um, yeah, I mean, you can say that, but like the vast majority of the people running, including the incumbents, are still like fairly well off people. 100 percent like yeah. and owning their own home yeah and, like you yeah. really have to be to run for office anyway it's, it's just, it takes resources mm -hmm. yeah. i mean yeah if you want to do well it has to be a full-time job but i mean you really don't have to the, the just, bar is very yeah, low you can yeah. Just yeah. Show, there's plenty of city councilors that just show up yeah some don't yeah. some some just don't some just don't speaking of all brasco coming coming back uh to to uh run again um so yeah, uh, if we're gonna stay on elections, I uh, looked up some more things. This could set the stage for for what it means to campaign uh, in Waltham right now. Um, if you're if you're looking at at large, and um, this year you have so many so many at large uh, candidates right now. Every at large candidate. Is vying for pretty much the bottom spot. Of course, you would like to be the top, you know, top, uh, top vote getter in the entire uh, city council. But you would settle if you're in the non-incumbent. You'd settle for last place, 100. And this year, this last place uh, finisher uh, for at large, you're probably they're probably going to get around 4,900 votes. That's what you're going for. Huge number. It's massive. Um, if you're Jonathan Paz running for for mayor. That number is more looks more like six thousand, probably a little more than that. Actually, I probably if I were to guess, and you can put me on the record, I guess it's going to be sixty one fifty uh, to win, um, if it's close. Uh, if you're in Ward One, you're looking for about nine hundred and fifty votes. If you're in Ward Three, very similar number, probably around nine hundred and fifty. Uh, if you're in Ward Four, you're looking at seven hundred. Uh, you're looking at six hundred. Sorry, um, in Ward Seven. Uh, there's 450 votes. And if you're in Ward 9 on the south side where we're at right now, that number is only about 380. And what's, you know, those are just numbers I'm throwing out there. What's very interesting about that is that all, every ward is split into two precincts, and every precinct has about the same number of voters in every precinct. Um, that's just how wards and precincts are cut up. And so that's, it should be, very similar people voting because that's how many registered voters there are. It's just in the south side, there's just so little engagement. And the farther north you go, the uh, the more that number rises. And so associated very highly with like renter population as well. Um, like not a coincidence, where nine has the most renters, has mm -hmm. lowest voter engagement. And then in places where even it's like very close to 50 50, I think Ward 5 has slightly more renters than homeowners. Ward one has like almost exactly 50, 50, 50 renters and homeowners. Still elections dominated by homeowners and which have very conservative, relatively um, people representing their wards. Why not? They've seen the effects that local elections have on their lives. They keep their property values down. They, you know, or keep them high. Yeah. 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 Residential taxes as well. And it keeps the city looking the way that people like to yeah. look. Yeah. Their streets look great. That's not actually. <laughs> well, I mean, it's more that it keeps things like the you know, car centric, that type of design mode. I'm sure, of course, it's definitely. Like, of the people, the the people who want. get appointed by people who are, you know, like that in council are going to do the things that they like to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, definitely excited for this election. Um, there's three preliminaries happening in September. Uh, you know, everyone's got their eye on that large who's going to get knocked off and to see how the playing field is looking. Um, I'm very curious to see how that goes. Um, with the introduction of George, um, as well as Paul Brasco throwing his hat in the ring, it becomes much harder for the non-incumbents to win. I'm really hoping for them uh, that they have an uphill battle. If you would, um, you know, if any of these candidates excite you, if Lizzie Gellis uh, excites you, if Ayala in Ward 3 excites you, if Eamon in Ward 9, any of the at large candidates, uh, Emma, Emily, if Jonathan Paz, if his, uh, his, his literature excites you, you have to get involved in these kinds of things. They are non incumbents, cards stacked against them. You need to be reaching out to them, see how you can help, either donating money, canvassing for doors is the most important part. I understand that that is a big ask for some people. Just, you know, just go to one of these canvases. Don't even canvas. Just go and just get acclimated to the environment, just get a feel for it, you know, socialize with these kind of folks. Um, 
not good time. Yeah. You can go outside, hang out with people. Yeah. If the weather isn't terrible. I mean, even if it is, you get to commiserate with people about it. Yeah. For yeah. real. Get off the internet. Touch some grass. Yeah. And it's all that pressure thing. Like when you knock on doors, you don't have to like convince people to vote for the candidate you're knocking on doors for. Because by far the most common reaction I have when I knock on doors is, oh, I didn't know we had an election this year. So just like letting people know that, oh, there is something to vote for, helps voter participation, very important for non-incumbents. And B, you know, the candidate you're canvassing for is the first name they hear about this upcoming election. Really good to have, you know, just the first impression. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, really valuable not on doors. If you have the time to volunteer, um, all the candidates are searching for volunteers. Yeah. 100%. So Paul ask right now. This is a busy election season, too. Very busy. Well, I'm excited about that. Moving on. Start with a high that's kind of a low. Um, Moody Street shut down. Um, you know, I will say that I am happy anything happens. I'm happy that it's shut down or, you know, I really wanted to reverse my language. It's really opened up. You know, it's opened up to anyone now, uh, just, you know, without a car. Um, and so I think if the neighborhoods weren't mobilized, if they weren't speaking out at, at these public meetings, if they weren't calling counselors, if they weren't calling the mayor, I think the mayor would have done away with that completely um and there would be cars right now uh going up and down the street but i think because people mobilized because people got organized and they did things we got something at least um so i'm gonna start i'm gonna start with that as a high and then i'm immediately gonna follow that up with a low which is the city is not taking it seriously at all um the movie should shut down there are other cities across the country that have entire committees for their pedestrianized streets. They take it very seriously. They're excited. They're enthusiastic about this. Um, but uh, Jeanette McCarthy is just is not enthusiastic about this uh, project. Um, it, and we, when, when it happened at the time, um, you know, we talked about the idea of, is this intentionally bad? Is this, uh, are they going about this in such a way that no one is going to be happy and then next year no one will be excited about it and no one will write letters and no one will get organized and mobilized and so they can just do away with this? Um, in, in that vein, like I was remembering when we were first talking about this that like you know, how there's a lot of stuff that has to get done now because that didn't have to get done before because they've been previously been done as like one big thing that was that all the restaurants that wanted to have street space signed on to and now every single one has to apply separately. So in the first few weeks of it, like there were a bunch of places that didn't have stuff out. Mm -hmm. I remember like I think Colleen specifically got one of the one of the um, store owners engaged in that because they didn't really know how to approach the whole city process for it. Mm -hmm. I think mean, it's 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 adding extra bureaucratic hurdles for something that doesn't really need to be there. And it's Nice that it's happening and really glad that the streets industrialized again. And I hope that it uh, is better next year. Yeah, I mean, it really sucks though because we're not setting ourselves up for success next year. Because, like, a big discussion during the Moody Street, like, public hearings and discussions uh, this spring was hey, let's collect data, let's plan for the future so that way we can go into next year with a better idea of what works, what doesn't. Um, I think Jonathan Boz came up with like a proposal that would instigate that. And then the mayor gave lip service when she, you know, did her about face and started saying like, oh, okay, actually we can, I do have the power to open up the street. Um, but it's not happening, at least not that I've heard of. We're going to go into next year, the exact same as it was this year, which is, um, you know, there being no data or information to back up, you know, what is successful, what is it, how businesses are impacted. It's just going to be the same discussion. Um, yeah, and really the only things that's going to affect it is like, you know, who's in power making the decision, because otherwise it's just going to be the same noise. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It'll be the same Joe Bizarre who during all of these discussions, um, love you Joe, uh, but I'm saying, you know, anecdotally that he, during the uh, pedestrianized movie streets last year, you know, we often saw nobody on the uh, utilizing it. Uh, but it's just like that's such that's so anecdotal and you know at what time of the day is he talking about you know when cars wouldn't really be there anyway um, and all of these things it's just going to be the the anecdotes of the people that are in power just making that decision if people are mobilized hopefully they will be and, and yeah. also like the, the, the fact that that was even like a thing that had 
like, like the fact that the determination is even being made in the traffic commission is kind of like a problem in and of itself because this is like a city asset, you know, like the industrialized portion of the city. Yeah, this should be an economic development. Yeah, thing. But yeah. The traffic commission is not like prioritizing anything related to that. They're prioritizing cars getting from one place to the other as fast as possible. They're not going to have any kind of like an open mind towards a pedestrianized street. And the fact that the decision was punted to them means that that's what the mayor wanted to happen. You know, yeah, that's just what it comes down to. Yeah, I think they do have to sign off on it, but yeah, it didn't have to end with them. Yeah, it didn't uh, have to be driven by that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it is a plus though, because like, as you said, the original plan mayor came out at the beginning of this year saying no yeah. pedestrian, no pedestrian movie street and took a lot of organizing and pause bringing up an opposing plan for and calling her bluff for the mayor to say, okay, actually, I'll do a little bit. And now there's people eating on Moody Street right now. Yep. People walking around on their bikes. So I'm happy about that. But I'm also <laughs> not happy that the city is not taking us seriously. We should have events all the time on it. Why are we waiting for the businesses and the nonprofits to do something? The city should be actively doing this. And I understand they do a little bit. I don't want to say none because they, I don't, it doesn't matter. They do a couple of things, but they do, they're not taking it seriously. They're not taking it seriously. Yeah. But the city does love not doing things. Yeah. Um, and big, big to fan. bring up a con was uh, with the budget, I do strongly like believe in what Colleen said and the video we posted to our site uh, and like what she said of like why she voted no on the budget, which is just because, um, you know, the current status quo for the administration and especially it's reflected in the budget. Is just doing bare minimum, do slightly less every year. Uh, anytime a hiring position opens up, instead of you know rehiring that person, how about we just cut the budget instead? Uh, which is just all, this gradual, very unnecessary austerity that leads to very ridiculous things. Where the actual uh, low that I'm leading up to is the fact that we don't really have a functional planning department right now. Waltham is about to go through a lot of big changes. It has to go through a lot of big changes. Uh, both because of the MBJ Communities Act, meaning we'll be zoning for more dense housing, and um, just generally there's a lot of advocacy for bike infrastructure. Both these things, like, you know, affecting how a city is built and designed for people is normally headed up by a planning department, and we don't currently have a functional planning department. We currently have our law department uh, looking at zoning changes. Uh, which is ridiculous. The law department themselves have been saying like, hey, we're not professionals on this. We don't have, we don't know how to work with any of the software. Um, like they're learning the bare minimum right now, trying to comply with this law, much less complying with the law in a way which is like thoughtful and which will like increase the quality of life for most people. So it feels like when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The law department takes care of it, but like, are they, yeah. Not not the right tool for the job. Yeah, yeah. We're losing out a lot on a lot of like qualified people making our city better because our mayor has like defunded so much of our city to the point where it's just running on fumes. Um yeah. And this also came up, sorry, still stuck on the uh planning department, especially. Uh, because I'm just brushing through so many lows right now. Um, <laughs> the master plan committee, um, they held a meeting that was not publicized beyond just a piece of paper on the message board, which we just barely missed. So it went unrecorded, unwitnessed. Uh, and the only thing they recommended out of that master plan meeting was to, um, ditch the, uh, bicycle committee. Um, it's like, like, like what yeah, bicycle yeah. Committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, it would have been an ad hoc thing, so it would have been like citizen and city councilors yep. by committee. Um, yeah, like and that's, person. yeah, so that's now uh, in the can, uh, which sucks because I was emailing my uh, my ward counselor, uh, Joey LaCava, who has previously uh, spoken in favor of blue bikes and bicycle generally. I'm like, hey, what's up with that? Uh, I saw that you voted against uh, us having a uh, bicycle committee. And he said, oh, well, that's the role of the planning department. So the planning department can take care of that. But we don't have a planning department, right? We have like two we have like two people, two or three people in our planning department currently that are just like, you know, they're not able to like take on more tasks such as like bicycle infrastructure or zoning. And so, and so long as we have this emaciated planning department, things aren't gonna get done. Things aren't gonna get nicer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Most most other cities, I'm sure with actual functioning planning departments, also. Have a bike and pedestrian advocacy committee uh 
but our city, which does not have that committee and also does not have a planning, a uh, robust planning department, apparently is just is going to let the planning department decide for that. Um, mm -hmm. I also had a low as the master plan committee because we've been mm -hmm. following it so closely for a year and a half now. We've been doing this for a year and a half. Um, and yeah, just just so low to that for the one thing that happened this session. It was particularly annoying because apparently it happened on literally the first day I went on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> so this committee that is developing a master plan for all of Waltham, which is what people have been talking about for a while. We talk about planning, and I always have the anecdote that planning only gets talked about during the election season for, you know, during that time, everyone's like, we need a robust planning department. We need a, we need a city planner. One person, uh, one person whose sole job is to play in a wall thing. Um, and then when the election is over, we don't talk about it anymore. I think this year with like the urban planning uh, crowd kind of getting more involved, we've been talking a little bit more about planning during the off, off, um, off years, which has been nice. But this is now that season where everyone talks about planning in the city. Um, so you're going to see a lot about that. Hopefully, I say this every election, hopefully something happens. This, this time, hopefully people follow through with this talk about needing uh, a better planning department, um, but I, it's just, that's what happens every year. But yeah, um, though, this is following up though for the master plan committee. Correct me if I'm wrong on the date, but this is following up on a master plan that was starting to be formed in the beginning of McCarthy's tenure in like 2006, which also didn't get completed. So basically, like throughout the entirety of like the past 20 years of like all the time McCarthy's been in office, like we haven't had a master plan. They sure. almost started, and then nothing came of it, and then here we are picking it up again almost 20 years later. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the idea of a master plan has been talked about for a long time, and I don't know. I think some of the stuff that didn't happen that it was like most of that previous master plan did actually get done. It's just, it was like reconciling like those plans. It was like reconciling what didn't get done, I think. Was... Well, that's good to hear, actually. That's good to hear, because um, I've gone through other more recent um, like city like planning documents. There was a transportation master plan mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was one. made in 2017. This is also as a master plan, but there was an ad hoc committee on affordable housing that released a plan in 2020 on what the city should do to address affordable housing. The Fernal had one as well. Fernal had one, and nothing has been done in regards to any of those. Like I have read through all of the affordable housing uh, plan, uh, zero of the items on that list are addressed. And the city patted themselves on the back when they released that. They were mm -hmm. like, they were so happy to put an affordable housing committee yeah. in, and then they're like, "Oh, we talked about it yeah. for a year. Yeah. We thought about it really hard, and we're not going to do anything." But we thought about it. It's like the affordable housing trust fund totally gets used. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it builds literally no housing. Yeah, yeah. So I was really upset about the master plan committee. Uh, really hoping that this committee in the next session when there's like new committee members uh has very transparent very enthusiastic meetings where you know the the residents of Waltham can go and listen to what they're talking about instead of like this weird like behind closed doors via email talking about the master plan committee uh but talking about the master plan of Waltham and also like just a low that they're like being so untransparent about hiring consultants. Like I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And for anyone that does it, that knows less about that is um, the master plan committee did uh, input hearings in all the wards um, and then canceled one at large. Uh, oh, wow. And yeah, the one's a citywide one. Um, and they got all of this good information about what the people wanted. Spoiler alert, it was mostly like 90% all in every single ward about pedestrian and bike safety and advocacy, um, which is not an exaggeration at all. Yeah, um, North Walton was coming out like, hey, it's yeah, dangerous yeah. for us to step out off of our driveway. Yeah, Trapello was complained about it specifically. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. even though, yeah, even the words where you wouldn't think that would happen. That is what most people talk about. And so the idea was floated during uh, these uh, hearings to hire consultants to look at all the data they're gathering, which is also terrible data anyway. Any consultant is going to look at this and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? How are what, we going to, are we going to, what are we going to do with this? Not systematic, not, yeah. none of that. Like, it, and yeah, it wasn't advertised correctly for any real data gathering professional to take seriously. And whatever. That's besides the point. That's another one. Um, but it seems like now they are actually going to hire consultants to look at this outdated information now. It's been like a year. Um, 
and we and we the residents of them have no idea what, what what's happening what what are you, what are you consulting with them about and what's going to come of it i have no idea yeah, um, because I think their answer to to as to like what are they going to be consulted about is literally everything because they have kicked literally everything to the master planning committee except for the bike and pedestrians committee ad hoc committee mm -hmm. which is which, which they decided committee. they didn't have to talk about yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they didn't have to consider that definitely a low for me yeah um <clears throat> I also think it partially comes like their knee jerk reaction to asking us asking them to do anything is oh we'll hire a consultant to do it is the fact that city government currently is so emaciated through unnecessary mm -hmm. austerity um that normally normal things that you know a city government could do on its own uh like rezoning they're like ah shit we don't have anyone to do that I guess uh we'll say we're gonna hire a consultant yeah um, it's always it's always a convenient answer yeah mm -hmm. with, the, with the timeline of whenever they get around to cutting the check for the person maybe mm -hmm. i kind of related to that that i had like kind of with a high and a low related to the um the discussion of like the the rat problem in the city and also co correspondingly the trash problem mm -hmm. so like i'm glad that they're the at the end past has passed the uh, resolution about the getting less lethal uh, rodenticide and stuff but at the same time one of the more concrete ways to go after the rat problem is with food supply for the thing and going after the trash it's mm -hmm. the way that that's going to end and it was just very frustrating to see her pushing back on michael chason the um CBW ordinance. and um you just talked about it a minute ago how are you doing with that trash enforcement in terms of um you know getting people to start put trash in barrels with lids so i think it was good until about two days ago when ron retired and now we're... Oh. <laughs> okay. um so uh you know ron was out there he had switched going from putting trash out early um to concentrating on people that weren't using barrels yeah. um so the plan is to still continue to do that, but you have to fill the position or pivot yep. someone in the in the department. But we we know if we don't work on the trash piece, the the rat piece is um, is going to continue to be where it's at. So the plan is to right. continue to do that, right? Or you go to carts, and then you don't have to worry about people putting them in their own barrels because right. they're given a barrel. Right, but that's like we just talked about that. I I, I want to be able to get through the summer. And, yes. You know, we have future, 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 future right? We'll always talk about the future here and dream a little dream. But um, I want to just make sure that 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 enforcement is continuing, and you do have a plan for that. Yeah, I'll just say this: I know future, future. But if it doesn't happen, like the issue is never going to go away. We can't enforce people to do things they don't want to do. And when if there aren't barrels that they're given with covers, yeah. The problem is never going to end. You're Terms giving them the option, like here, you don't have an option. This is what you need to use. This will keep the rats away. Other cities are blaming us because they have those carts. We don't. So until that changes, that's that's your answer. We're fighting an uphill battle. Yeah, but there's an answer. I hear you. Pointing out that, you know, in six months from now, if we do this, if we pursue the, the program to get everyone a bin for recycling, like the blue recycling, or for, for trash, like the blue recycling bins we already have, in six months we could already have it. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of uh, presented as an unacceptable sort of path forward. And what can we do for the summer? I want something now. And there's no short term solution. You need to do concrete things that change how. how like what the physical situation is on the ground. You can't just, you know, do more enforcement and have it fix a problem. You know, have sending one guy out to do enforcement for a city of 60,000 people. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You have to approach it systematically. And, you know, yes, it's good to not have poison getting thrown out for whatever animals, but also you need to not have trash being left out. And, hey, look, this lets us qualify for grants that we can otherwise get. So then this is how you sort of build up on that year over year and build more more of a robust city as opposed to an austere one. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, Michael Chasen, I believe it was. Long. Yeah, Michael Chasen, CBW director. Um, not a city councilor. He was yes. a high. Yeah. Hearing him speak, just a very practical answer, a very obvious answer to a yeah. problem, was just great to hear. Yep. Um, sucked to hear a city councilor push back on it, yeah. but you know, often the problems we face are not new problems, and there are already um solutions that other people have figured out. We just got to go along with it, and oftentimes there is funding attached. I'm going to put a picture of this up on the screen, but while I was on vacation, I was in Italy and they have trash containers for like to deal with like rats in cities and they're underground and people just, you know, there'll be a container buried underground that can then get pulled up out of the ground when it's full by a truck and then carted away like a garbage truck. And instead of having like a garbage day every day of the week, it's picked up from those locations whenever they're full. I have to assume like there's some sort of system for that but that is like, very cool like it, it, the buried under the ground the rats can't get into it and instead of having everyone have their own personal trash bin on the curb it's sort of set up like that in some places mm -hmm. there's other solutions it's just a question of and i mean like and we're the only city that doesn't have a limit on our trash that, that we throw out throw out it's true so. mm -hmm. in our in our immediate neighbors yeah <laughs> Uh, one of the highs for me was at the very, very beginning of the session. Um, I thought it was particularly hilarious when Paul Cates voted against himself becoming chair. Yeah, um, so so essentially what's going to happen is that uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur and George Darcy attempt to vote for uh, Paul Cates to be the chair of the committee instead of uh, Vidal. And if, if Cates had voted for himself, he would have been. So let's see. I nominate Carlos Vidal. Okay, uh, Councilor McLaughlin. I nominate Paul Katz. I second the nomination of Councilor Vidal. Point of order. We don't have a second in our council rules. Uh, um, Colleen Bradley MacArthur. Councilor Katz. Councilor Darcy. Councilor Katz. Councillor Katz. Councillor Vidal. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor Vidal. Councillor Vidal. Councillor Carlos Vidal. Thank you. What's hilarious about the clip is that is that Paul like try to tries to stammer. He says that he wants to he wants to second the motion for Carlos. That is not how the Walton City Council works at all. He's Paul's been in many of these meetings. He knows that seconds aren't a thing in Walton City Council. Uh, but it's just hilarious that if he had voted for himself, he would have been the chair. Like Carlos, like thanks the committee for their confidence, but there, there there's overwhelming confidence that Paul should have been the chair of that as well, uh, which is hilarious. Um, and of course, you know, he can, you know, he's going to say he didn't want to be chair. He, you know, he trusts Vidal uh, and wants to do that. But I just thought it was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Um, especially because on the, on the wrap up session uh, last time, I made a prediction that Paul was going to flounder as a city councilor. Um, I believe I used that word. Um, and then the very next thing that he was able to do was block himself from becoming the chair of a, of a committee. Uh, I think I can understand him not wanting to rock the boat with the other councillors he gets along with, but also like I, I guess this would have been something for him that would have been helpful for him politically to have, you know, here, here's the thing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's also this is a thing that Carlos has been doing for several years now. So it probably would have just been it would have been antagonistic to accept to have gone through with it. Mm -hmm. It was still funny that he had to vote against himself. Yeah, he blocked himself. Uh, speaking of Vidal, one of the lows of my entire city council experience this past, the past six months was her, was his comments during the budget hearings, trying to get certain committees that are meeting over Zoom to meet in person. That was a particularly low point for me. And now, why are you still meeting via Zoom? Well, While most of our commissions and boards in this body itself, we're meeting in person now. I think you and the Conservation Commission are the only for some reason, uh, the organization. I believe the CPC is also Yeah, the CPC, you're right. I did talk to on, on Cons Zoom, Mr. Barrett and, yesterday. And the, the reason is, is uh, well, there are a number of reasons. I think we mentioned this last time. That, that uh, first of all, that room uh, in the basement mm -hmm. where we meet uh, is very closed. And so uh, it's not well ventilated. Um, and it has a much higher 
uh, potential of what? for transmittal of, of, come on, you know of what? COVID, you mean? COVID, Oh, yes. COVID, I, I wasn't sure. I, 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 <laughs> I wasn't so, sure what you were referring to, because you guys met there before COVID happened, correct? Yes, we met there before okay. COVID. Are you looking yeah. for a new place? To however, meet? however, let, let, let me say that that there are advantages to meeting on Zoom, especially for a commission like the Historical Commission. There's documentation which the members need to see and the public needs to see, and it's much easier to see that on Zoom when you're sharing documents on Zoom than it is before people would come into the room and, and a developer would put some kind of board up at the front of the room and people couldn't see. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's impossible to have it angled so both the commission can see it and the public can see it, whereas this way, everybody can see the documentation. So, so there are some advantages to, to working on Zoom. Now, going back to your statement about the room not being ventilated enough, therefore there's a higher level of people getting COVID. Are you looking? into a different room where so you can start meeting in person moving forward? Um, well, the, the, uh, the auditorium okay. in Government Center on Monday nights, and unfortunately we meet on Monday nights, is you know, opposite the, the commission, so we can't meet in here, uh, opposite the council, so we can't meet in here, and, and Monday nights, so the, the Waltham Philharmonic rehearses in, in, mm -hmm. in the auditorium. So okay. I don't think you want us kicking out the Philharmonic. So. Um, so, so that's a problem. Okay. Yeah, I did look into that okay. and, and as a possibility, but, but unfortunately we can't do that. So you, there's no way you're going to go back in person because of the room then? Well, Is that what you're telling not, me? not at this point. I mean, if, if something could be done about that room, <laughs> then, then fine. But okay. I mean, that room is, it, you know, it's, it's very hot and, and otherwise we'll have to have the windows all open in the middle of winter. It's letting okay. all that energy out. So, okay. Well, in that case, I will talk to the mayor because okay. I think I need this commission to meet in person. I think everyone should be meeting in person. The reason being, and I'll tell you why, when we, when we meet in person, I, I, I'm in a line of business in which body language says a lot when you speak to a board and the respect that you pay to the board when you're in front of them. It's the same way how you are dressed in front of us today because you're meeting in front of our, the finance committee. I think that says a lot about the petitioner or the person presenting in front of you. Uh, and body language says a lot about how you are presenting your case rather than being in a video call or on a phone with no video whatsoever. So I, I definitely, I talked to the Conservation Commission and I talked to Mr. Barrett last, yes, uh, last Thursday about it. Uh, I think it's important to uh, to start meeting in person. Hello, because like, he didn't give a good reason. There was no good reason. Like during his talking points, he never talked about like, like what being in person, like how that would benefit the committee at all. And he was just like, I prefer a committee to meet in person. I think that's professional. Those are the standards I want to live by. That's just a shitty thing to say. As you know, you've got committees that are doing their due diligence. They're doing everything that the city requires of them. They're doing it well. Um, and then so to just say, I want you to change it up completely, uh, alienating disabled folks and other, and other folks and just making it much less accessible uh, just because you feel entitled to that. You feel entitled to be able to tell people how they do their own committees is just it was so gross to me and so ableist and uh particularly the welcome once again though shout out to the people who aren't city councilors speaking at city council um the historical commission dude who was speaking um and he pushed back against carlos and gave very good reason for them to be remote yeah it's mm -hmm. easier it's more accessible it's easier to share documentation it's easier to give presentations um there are a lot of good reasons they're doing their job better than they I mean, based on his description, they're doing their job better than they would be if it was in person, simply because it is better designed that way. Yep, yep. and I think the Conservation Commission, too, it said that like they've got a lot of people that attend the meetings that are like engineers that do stuff all over the state. And mm -hmm. it's just more convenient to share documents on a Zoom call with everyone and more convenient to attend without having to like necessarily physically be there. Yeah. And I mean, like for me personally, like as an engineer, like I much prefer meetings I don't have to drive to go to get to. Mm -hmm. Shout out Phil Moser from uh, the Conservation Committee and Ward Isaacson from the uh, Storkel Committee. They both did a great job uh, talking about that. Yep. But I think they're going to. I think Carlos is going to get his way. Uh, we'll see. Um, but I, you know, because Robert's rules, which is the rules that the City Council has to adhere by, this is like it makes it very hard to push back on people 
Um, and so there was there's no discussion about it. Vidal said his shitty comment, and it, uh, you know they said words back, and then that was pretty much it. You know nobody spoke about it. Uh, the mayor spoke a little bit about uh, later on, much later on, uh, about you know her decision to have them in Zoom versus not. But the vibe I got was that they're going to be forced to. Hopefully not. I would definitely like to see them remain at Zoom. I would like to see all city council meetings return to Zoom, all committee meetings return to Zoom, make it much more accessible for everyone. Uh, but we're not going to get that. It's the problem. It makes it too accessible. Yeah, for real. Um, I have a high. Yeah. Um, very recent uh, housing rights notification ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, this is more high on the effort of everyone who organized in favor of it. Um, there are very few city councilors. I think just George Darcy, Pauline Bradley MacArthur, and Jonathan Paz, who were actually like signing on and pushing this in city council. But thanks to all the organization uh, from a lot of the people watching this and then watch CDC especially, um, you got a citizen input hearing. Uh, there's a lot of momentum around this. Um, and it's nice just forcing forcing our city councilors to actually acknowledge the housing crisis. There are very few moments where like in their working lives, our city councilors are actually acknowledging the housing crisis, either in their personal life because they're homeowners who are just trying to see their home values rise, or like in their like life as a public official, where the housing crisis almost never brought up on the city council floor. Uh, like we heard this during that preserving residential zone neighborhoods uh, bullshit, mm -hmm. uh, where they were kicking like short term renters in college students out of single family neighborhoods. Zero sympathy, zero thought for what would happen to the people who are currently living for you to continue to do what you do and what building does is that we need to look at that ordinance and outline and highlight the definition of what the single family in our book reads so that there's no gray area period uh, again and i apologize if i wasn't clear all of the cases that i have cited say um, even without a definition. Everyone knows what a single family zoning district is supposed to look, act, and live like. But it could not hurt, as I said, to address some of the attempted excuses some of these people have tried to use. Um, like the city councilors don't give a shit, but currently like we are forcing our city council to at least talk about it. Uh, and listen to us, which is great. There's a lot of great momentum there, uh, fighting for the rights of renters, especially. And I think like when they, you can hear it in the rhetoric that some of the councilors when they talk about the situation, where they're like referring to people as like taxpayers of Waltham and stuff, or mm -hmm. versus residents of Waltham, as if the people that live in Waltham and pay rent, pay rent to a landlord aren't also taxpayers or contributing to the tax base in the city in any other way. We're just asking that you provide photocopy pieces of paper that someone else has already translated. The, the housing rights notification ordinance accomplishes these modest, modest, modest goals. These are modest goals. 50% of Waltham are renters. And I think that there's a lot of that and I think that for me, it was definitely like a low seeing just the number of like turn the amount of turnout for the in, in opposition to the very simple notification ordinance. Or if they're going to react like it's rent control over notification ordinance, then they've already like you know they've not really they weren't even acting like rent control. They were acting like it was the total decommodification of housing. Yeah. And I don't really understand how you can just single out one industry. If you have the power to do such a thing, does that mean you have the power like, to shut any industry down from their customers' bank? You guys have the power to say that the citizens of Wall Street don't pay for the food anymore. Go to the grocery store, get whatever you want. I, I don't know why. How, I, I'm really asking questions. I know you can't answer, but where does, where, where does the line get drawn? Do you have the power to say that we don't have to pay our Mortgages? Yes, uh, yeah. No rent? People yeah. are living here for free? <laughs> That's what this ordinance is doing? It was insane. Yeah. Like, it's the concept. Like, like, you got to keep your powder dry. You don't need to go out immediately like that. But they did. And it's just like, it, it, it doesn't look good, especially with rent. And then it's, 
the housing situation the way that it is to be pushing back in that way on such a basic thing like mm -hmm. it's not that controversial and, mm -hmm. and i think that it made a, it was not a as they say it was not a good look for a lot of these landlords mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also it was like, not to harp on this but in terms of like the actual like comments submitted it, it was there was far more people that actually put their name on the record in support of that ordinance and like gave testimony in support of it it was just the hand raising that was it with, that was heavily in favor of the landlords so mm -hmm. that will be that was not discussed before the summer session you, they had the opportunity to and they punted it until fall so we'll be seeing that again potentially in august yeah so yeah that um yeah they decided in the last city council meeting to uh table the item it was uh the first opportunity and the last one uh for the summer session to chat about the the ordinance um and they yeah the, like james said they decided against it so sometime you know it could happen in august when the special meeting occurs it could happen in september when it when it uh comes back to session but because this is an election year i think there's going to be quite a few people that want to do everything in their power to wait until the election is over uh, to make this happen. And then there's going to be several people that want to do everything in their power to make it happen before the election season, because everything is politicized right now. And so I'm very curious to see that will definitely be coming up uh, either at the special meeting in August or immediately in September. Um, I'm very curious to see what happens with that. But yeah, I mean, one of my lows was the uh, was the comments made. I mean, it's just so, so low. And just so I am a 98 year old German woman. She came here in 1956 with two children and a husband. She speaks beautiful English. Beautiful English. If you want to help the immigrant or anybody, make sure they can speak English. There's plenty of resources out there. <clears throat> This notification thing is crazy. Thank you very well, much. Not ignorant in the sense that it's like gross, but ignorant in the sense that you didn't read what the ordinance was. So many. I would be uh, embarrassed yeah, to yeah, go up yeah, there like that. Yeah. Like, oh my god. Just goodness. like, yeah, I don't know if like somebody said, like, hey, they're uh, initiating rent control in Waltham. You need to speak out against it. But just like so many people were saying, I own property in Waltham. If this goes through, how am I going to pay my mortgage? My brother in Christ. The ordinance is how you pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's it's getting the resources for 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 raft for for just like helping pay your rent. That is how you pay your mortgage. If it's not like, yeah, it's it's wild to me. You know? Also, like showing up with a sob story about how this is going to destroy your business doesn't isn't making you yeah. the case that you're like an the competent administrator of the property. I'm here in opposition of this movement. Um, that. As you may notice, I'm a younger um, individual. I, I, I did my part, put together my down payment, and actually was able to, with a friend, afford a two-family in Waltham. Without the uh, additional income of rent, that two-family is no longer affordable. You know, it's just... Yeah. No. In terms of things that were ignorant in the gross way of things, going back a little further, um, which was a while ago. So, um, but when city council had their discussions around the NBT Communities Act, a lot of ignorant and a gross way comments from city councilors. You had, I think, Tate's first brought it up, and then a couple other city councilors also decided to talk a little bit about it about how, oh, if we're required to build housing, how about we just kick out our current, um, our current like public public housing tenants. Which well, they did say, oh, just kidding. Or, or uh, that's we, still a really fucked up thing to bring up. Or why don't we remove the Brandeis T station? Question that I I just have to ask. And I just have to ask. This isn't this isn't a an endorsement of anything. If we were to close one of the transit stations, let's say we're gonna close Roberts and we will only have one transit station. What does that do to the numbers? Does that do anything? What it means is that you'd have to have the entire 1,991 in the Carter Street area. But but we I, wouldn't. I mean, need, I don't think we have the authority. But we wouldn't to close need 4,000. Station anyway. It wouldn't. We still need 3,982. We still need that same number. Yes. 
Uh huh. That was the other one. Mm-hmm. Which once again doesn't change anything, but they're just like you know spitballing how they could be pieces of shit. Yep. Um. Yep. Sorry, that's a bit strong. I don't know. I, they weren't being rhetorical, but why would they even? Bring I stand by it. And yeah. who wasn't being rhetorical yeah. was Kathy and Mc, or not Kathy and um Kathleen, Kathleen McMiniman, um, who um. I'd like to reshare the video from like years ago where she went on this like insane conspiratorial like uh <laughs> the our the libs are coming for our pristine suburbs rant direction and if you think this is bad you wait till the federal government under the decree that's going to be given to us to get rid of the suburbs and create urban areas and fairness will take place um, um, to get, 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 get to remove the suburbs yeah like, because it, it was yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but a little bit of that came out during that MBTA Communities Act City Council discussion as well uh when it was this this very like uh I think it's like a Yogi Berra uh like ah uh, no one's gonna want to live here because there will be too many people yep. you know there's so many people that it's unpopular because mm-hmm. it's so popular if we build more housing so more people can live here it was just this like very like evident like disdain for the idea of any new people living at all. Damn. Just very mm-hmm. circular too, in yeah. a way. Because like it, it it you can't have a growing city if you don't have more housing built. Like it just doesn't work otherwise. I mean, we, we do have a growing city. So, yes, They're yes. bringing tons and of it doesn't work. <laughs> They're bringing tons of workers to Waltham. We have like millions of square feet of commercial development green like a total of like 10,000 workers to Walham over the span of a decade. And we're not building housing for them. Those 10,000 people are just displacing the people who are currently here. Yep. You know, just, just in like the span, like just in the time that I've like lived here, the rent has gone up like astronomically. It's like unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I moved to Walham, it had the lowest rent out of like, you know, Weston, Lexington, and Newton. Now it is like higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, is the MBTA's community act a higher or low session? Uh, I would call it a high something because because nothing good came out of it um, so far. Uh, but it forced the announcers to talk about it. And I think it's good to have our elected officials actually talking about the housing crisis because it is genuinely just like the last thing from their mind. Um, like so many people, like I think Bill Hanley on his campaign website, I was checking out his housing policy because he responded to me a bit on housing discussions. Uh, so I looked up his campaign website and the only thing he had talking about the housing crisis in Waltham wasn't even talking about housing prices. It was say, hey, it was his policy position being, hey, we need homes to grow in value. We need housing to get more expensive. And that was the only thing you said about mm-hmm. it. Um, so with that in mind, um, you know, just another reason to vote, especially like if you are a renter. Um, so because our current like elected officials and some of the new runners like Will Hanley, like genuinely you are so far in the back of their mind um you are, are you so are there, far first of all yeah. yeah they're you are so far removed from what they care about because they just care about housing getting more expensive so that way their home value grows uh whereas everyone else is suffering because home values are rising you know right. housing is getting more expensive that's just class war yeah 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 i had the opportunity to talk to the guy running against uh gates in ward seven and robert davis robert davis and he also is of the mind that he just wants to return to the way things were Ooh. specifically in the time window before, before or, or, or rather after um the streetcars got taken away after that but before i guess like something happened mm-hmm. but but definitely cars on the road definitely suburban sprawl but none of, none of that streetcar is none of that density oh yeah no anytime any anyone at old waltham's nostalgic it's always for 1940s to 1970s yeah uh when white flight was happening you know oh, most of all family was getting deforested for single family neighborhoods um when it became illegal legal to build a lot of dense housing with exclusionary zoning laws um that is that is what they're reminiscing on yeah it's not old Waltham, which was all farmland and women workers uh and unionizing uh mm-hmm. they mean they mean um white flight yeah <laughs> which is very funny when you also think of things i think you brought this up um we're even talking about like so many disparate things, not even to the degree of like, you know, the way our exclusionary neighborhoods are designed, but just uh, in regards to something as simple as bicycle infrastructure, I think you were, one of y'all said Kathy Ann Harris when discussing bike um, bike parking, bike racks on Moody Street, 
he was like, oh, Vicarax wouldn't uh, fit on the actual Moody Street because it doesn't fit with his historical character. Yeah. Uh, when bikes have been, people have been biking on Moody Street far longer than they have been driving on Moody Street. Yep. Um, <laughs> and also, yeah, cars are not historical. <laughs> yeah, no. Whenever people talk about like old walk and wanting to turn to that history, it's only ever that brief period. Yeah, of time. Yep. it was when them and their parents lived in Waltham. Yeah, yeah. That make Waltham great yeah, again. I, era. I, I yeah. want to go back to when I personally was 14 years yeah. old. Um, on one of our debriefs, very recently, I asked what your predictions for MBTA Communities Act was. Have you put any more thought into it? Do you, I, I do really you have no predictions, especially because um, we don't have any professional planners or... How long like, will the state give us until they're like, yo, do something? Oh, yeah. So the absolute deadline for enacting zoning changes is December 31st of 2024. Uh, so, so to, to finish to be at the end, to exact To, to rezone. Okay. To okay. like pass the laws. Interesting. Uh, which know. means in like no way... Like anything's happening before the end of this year. <laughs> yeah. Like they're going to build us up last minute for sure. Um, It'll be the last city council. You can have a year. huge impact on what Waltham will look like in the future, how affordable Waltham will be based on this election. So, yeah, I have no idea of any predictions of what will happen. I mean, um, but it will be hugely influenced by this election. Yeah, so, if yeah. you want a more affordable and more inclusive Waltham, like vote for people who are talking about that. And, also, uh, yeah. and do not vote for. Um, yeah, don't vote for Jeanette McCarthy. I mean, yeah. that's not a, that's and, not a secret. <laughs> and also, not even just voting, but just being aware, being engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, if you've not watched our show before, you don't know MTA communities like this. We have to rezone for 4,000 units by right. And we're going to have, the city council is going to have some say in it. I, it's it's not, No, the city council actually has 100% say. 100%? 100%? Yeah, I mean, 100% to up or down or? No, 100% to draft up or down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think uh, in the, like, the 50s through 70s period. By the way, make Waltham great again, that time period. Um, <laughs> the one thing they did do really good was um, public housing creation. Um, because it wasn't illegal yet. Or, yeah, I mean, that, and yeah. actually they just cared, yeah. um, apparently. Um, the... Uh, so yeah, stay involved, stay engaged, uh, because is, this is going to be a very important time in Waltham. Very important. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and also for the, it's 4,000 new units by right, but like, it isn't necessarily, it, it's it's a lot of the, a lot of the units that are in the areas that need to get increased are already relatively dense. They're just not prohibited by our existing zoning. And mm -hmm. a lot of the zoning is yeah. just about. I mean, Warrendale, I wouldn't say dense at all. No, yeah, so this look, could look a lot of different ways. Yes. Like, if Waltham chooses, if our city councilors choose to just, like, rezone Southside, that's just going to lead to a lot of teardowns and yep. replacement, because you're basically replacing what currently exists with the exact same density, only newer and therefore more expensive. If we yep. choose to rezone all our, uh, like, commercial and industrial land, where currently there's only, like, office buildings and parking lots, you know, that's, you know, a bunch of new housing, not displacing anyone. Yeah. Uh, they could like rezone low density neighborhoods like single family neighborhoods. You just see a lot more integration where low lower income families are actually able to live in places where previously you know you have to be able to own a you have to be able to afford a eight hundred thousand dollar house to live there, right? And also, like if the north side had more density in that way, it would all related to some of the other things that have been going on with like the uh, the busing or the bus mm -hmm. situation. There would then be more of a case to have buses up to North Wall than if there was more density located there because of like housing getting distributed up there and, and whatever way. Like. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I would like to throw this in just since you brought it up. Um, there are a lot of things that influence where transit gets placed, um, but the number one thing that influences transit ridership more even than like the level of service is whether people, a lot of people, actually live there. You know. I hear a lot of complaints from North Wall about, hey, why don't we have bus service? Uh, it's because there are enough people to justify it. It's just a bunch of like $800,000 single family homes up in North Waltham. Um, I mean, the MBTA is not going to prioritize those neighborhoods mm -hmm. over so many other neighborhoods in the greater Boston area that have dense housing, that have large populations of low and moderate income people who need transit service, right? Yeah. And it's also people that have the mindset of, oh, you have to run government like a business and, and like fix it on cut, cutting costs and stuff like that. And it, the cost cutting is going to lead to the things that aren't money, like aren't, you know, highly used getting reduced because mm -hmm. you're trying to, you have to triage and yeah. yeah. With the MBTS Communities Act, with uh, the 128 uh, remodel, uh, Waltham is going to look very different in a decade. Very, very different. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, 
Speaking of McMiniman, um, her weirdly racial comment um, during the tenants' rights ordinance was a low for me because it was just kind of like mask off. Councilor Pass, you have the floor. I presented this matter in different language and the rules and ordinances. Other than English? With different language, different ordinance language. But I'm not sure. Like, I'm trying, you know, I, I try and give people the benefit of the doubt. Was she trying to make a joke? Was she just trying to be dismissive and didn't realize the racial component? I'm just like, I just don't really know what was going through her mind. No, it was, as so it was this is a, just a disgusting comment. The, and it's unnecessary. It's yeah, fun. unnecessary. Um, and, you know, you can you can go back and forth on if Jonathan was being correct about what he was legislating for there, um, if he was going by it in a correct way. But just, you know, just bringing race into something like this is just disgusting, really disgusting. It's definitely, that was definitely a low point for me in the city council this session. I mean, just a lot of tension around the um, the housing resolutions this this session in general, I think. No. But I mean, like, it's worth, worth noting that, like, there was the public hearing for that that we were talking about the, the landlord family reunion but the run-up to that involved a lot of watch showing up to committee meetings with a bunch of people filling up the room until they got heard you know the, yeah yeah literally hundreds of man hours yeah. of watch volunteers uh yeah. just showing up for months at a time for months on end until this was scheduled it was a lot of work yeah. on part of watch cbc yeah. Speaking of city council pussyfooting around, um, a pro that is also another uh, very conditional high <laughs> is um, the Silver House is pretty much guaranteed uh, to happen. Uh, and it is pretty much guaranteed to happen sometime relatively soon because if Waltham tried to delay it any longer, it would be considered discrimination and they could maybe be hit with a discrimination lawsuit. Is people recovered from addiction covered by uh, like disability protections. And if Waltham tries to put it off any longer than they already have, uh, they could get hit with a lawsuit. Um, yeah. And I mean, I was I was hoping, curious if it would get addressed before the summer break. It got pushed out in the summer break. So we'll see what happens next. And where is it right now? Licenses and franchises? or where uh, Yeah. It? So last I heard, um, there was. Uh, they're, they're, the neighbors that have an issue were in discussion with the city attorneys, I guess, about what the agreement will be. So I guess mm -hmm. if there's, there can only be so much that they exact out of this agreement, so they just have to come to terms on what that is. Yeah, and the sober house person, I think, made it very clear that there won't be any major like changes to like the actual makeup of the but, house, because any like major... like Things that would require going back to the building department, for example. Yeah, because that would he made pretty clear that would almost certainly be like discrimination by intentionally delaying the process for no good reason. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you, you be making a mountain out of molehill, like, oh, you have to relocate these stairs or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some of those comments were pretty gross too. Folks really love their property values. Yes, I like to report on them because yeah. at, at the end of the day, like this is this is people's lives, and like the city is for everyone, but not just the people that happen to have inherited a house. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one more low listed here: uh, the pride resolution. Um, not everyone signing on to the pride resolution was a particular low for me. Um, in um, 2021, uh, we had the first public fry. It was in someone's backyard and it wasn't a complete public invitation, but that was like the first time that the city all came together uh, for an act of pride celebration. Um, and uh, the year before that was the first ever in Waltham's history Pride Resolution, um, sponsored by Christine Mackin. Um, and so we're like, we're making progress in all the city councilors, especially in Massachusetts, especially nowadays, you know, they all have to say, oh, we're 100% complete support. They have to. Um, so that being said, there are some exceptions, like Kathleen McMiniman, who actually did not even vote yes on the original uh, resolution. It was a roll call, and she, uh, she voted present, uh, which is just like, crazy um, yeah yeah 
Uh, so this year, um, a very similar pride resolution now. It's an annual thing now, which is great. Um, uh, people have to sign on to resolutions if they support it or not. And not everyone did. And uh, that was a really low point for me, especially because several of those people came to pride. And it's just like, what are you doing here if you're not going to sign on and publicly say I support it? Um, Once again, it was just Jonathan Paz, Colleen Bradley MacArthur, and George Garcia, right? Yeah. Um, oh, well, but, Thomas signed on late. Yeah, yeah. Tom, Thomas Stanley. Tom, Tom Stanley signed on the day of as it was going around. But, and, you know, they'll say that it's politicized. They'll say it's politicized, but I mean, everything is politicized. You signed on, you signed on to a million other things. Uh, the session, uh, despite an election year being happened, like, what is it about pride that, uh, was too political like what we're talking about people's lives we're talking about the safety people feel living in the community uh and then to show up to pride after that is is, is still... feeling bad about it yeah. yeah well it's also the the i mean they, they can say it's political but it's also kind of like grade school behavior because it's like if if jonathan Paz, Colleen bradley and carter and george darcy said not to jump off the bridge would you jump off the bridge yeah <laughs> like it's, it's... <laughs> I don't really, I don't really get it either. It, well, again, honestly, when talking to some of these counselors, they kind of want to have it both ways on this kind of thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like, I understand the tenants' rights ordinance. Like, if that came to a vote, the people would be like, oh, this is very politicized. I'm going to vote now. Like, I could, I could, like, I don't agree with that at all, but I could at least, I understand that. I understand where you think it's too politicized for you to just vote one way because Jonathan will be able to claim it as a victory. But I mean, Jonathan, Colleen, they've just been supporters of Pride. Uh, they're not championing it at all. They're not championing it even in the slightest. They're just, in, they're just doing this annual tradition of making a Pride resolution, and you're not going to sign on to it because you're a baby and you think it's too political. And also, it feels like projection, too, that they think it's that that's a political thing as opposed to just like, you know, a resolution. To do what yeah. To talk about what yeah. They're not going to put it on their literature uh, yeah. that they got a unanimous pride resolution through after all their hard work they just like they're doing a thing that we've always done uh recently um and uh it was sad for me uh and the community to not have the entire city council sign on to it it's just like needlessly personalizing the thing too because it's not like this entire like it's not like the pride is just those three counselors they really didn't have that much to do with, with like with, yeah with it all it's yeah. Just they were asked to present it yeah. by constituents yeah. so that's the I, just not a good look for the counselors on that on that front. Absolutely not. This just popped in my head since you were just talking about the House Rights Association ordinance. By the way, um, I still think it would be more political. Like they would be making political if they voted against, just because um, the Housing Rights Certification Ordinance was one of the recommendations by the 2020 report from the Ad Hoc Committee on Affordable Housing. One of the recommendations was, hey we should have something that guarantees that renters are notified of their rights prior to eviction. That's what I hear. Yeah. Once again, there are a lot of really good documents that city council and our city government has produced, such as the transportation master plan and the community affordable housing report, which have a lot of really good suggestions. Like genuinely, I think they're great. Um, it'd be really cool if city council acted on them. I, I need to double check. I need to fact check myself on this, but on the subject of like things getting done last minute because of the like, the, the um related to the NDK Communities Act, I think one of the things listed on our action plan was like improvements to like the bus stations and stuff of like things that were in the works. Mm -hmm. And that the now those um bus um the um shelters are getting redone as a result of that. The probably as a result of that where they'd previously been tabled for a while, we're just not getting talked about. Nice. That was something that was again presented by Jonathan Paz. That was in 2019. Yeah. That yeah. long ago, yeah. right yeah. when he got into City Council. That was his, that was his I, first project. And, uh, first project. And, and I'm not gonna. I mean, we, we were, at this point we've, we've referenced this multiple times, but like this is when Kathleen Kinnaman had talked about this as if it was methadone mile or something. Yeah. The, 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 the first you you put a place for people to stand outside of the sun while they're waiting for the bus, and next thing they're gonna be using needles and all. Yeah. Cannot be over inside. There are so many city councilors have such a disdain. Yeah. For anyone who isn't a wealthy homeowner. Mm -hmm. Um. Or anyone who like doesn't drive a car, um, yeah. But there are many city councilors who aren't like that, and it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Please vote. Please knock on doors. Yeah. 
is is a lot of good people to spend your time working for this year. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even say. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. The way that things are right now is not the way they have to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say even that the way the people that believe and control the, the way things are right now are even in the majority. You know, it doesn't have to be a majority of people making decisions. That it, it's just whoever is more organized. It just comes down to that again across across everything, uh, almost almost every situation, almost every uh, decision. It's just who's more organized. Is it going to be uh, the people that that are conservative, whether Democrat or Republican, to not move Waltham forward in any sense, uh, or is it going to be the people that do? And we're gonna we're gonna see. Uh, what happens? Yeah, because the vast majority of Waltham will not be voting in this election. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like all of the work is just finding people and letting them know that hey, this is what matters. This is why you should vote. We do have an election this year. Yeah, you guys want to? You guys want to predict what our voter turnout is going to be in this year? Uh, I do not want to. Uh, I was going to say, I'm going to say twenty nine percent. That's that's pretty high. Oh wait, wait, wait it's my oral year. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 35 40. Oh, 35 40. Oh my god, yeah, this is like, way too high. Big money, big money. <laughs> We're gonna be excited, man. That's oh, high. that would I mean I if it was 40%, I'd be very yeah, happy. Yeah. I'm gonna say 32%. Um, and uh, of course it should also be said that that's 32% of registered voters. That is not 32% of the population of Walton. And so it's just like vast majority of people not voting vast majority of people thinking that local government has absolutely no effect on their life uh and of why me and i understand why they would think that because uh politics doesn't really give a shit about you um unless you're a small population of people and on in that mind uh if you think uh if you think that solar energy is good uh if you think that environmentally friendly building construction is good uh these are both things that came up in city council that city council was broadly against mm -hmm. uh, while our planet is burning. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, we're seven years early trying to do this. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that's somebody throwing a dart at a dartboard saying by 2030 we're going to be fossil fuel independent. But <laughs> but that's just the United States. What are we doing with the rest? Oh, of that's the Massachusetts. Country? Okay, so that's Massachusetts. What is the rest of the country doing? They're following California. Okay, so we'll have Massachusetts and California and all the states in between. What are they doing? Yeah, you know, I, I <laughs> what is the rest of the what is I'm just I'm just I'm just trying to thinking out loud now. It's like what is the rest of the world doing? And I agree. There could be a plan. Because the world shut down in a matter of three days. The world did. We all got together because there was a massive pandemic and the world was able to shut down in three days. But now to have Massachusetts say, we're going to do this, but the rest of the country is going to be like, great, more gas, more oil for us. The only, the only resolution or ordinance that had anything to do with climate change, it was one thing, and they shot it down immediately like that. Yeah. Um, like, I know, like, we personally are like, you know, a tiny minority of weirdos. Um, but city council is elected by a tiny minority of weirdos. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But generally, it's the uh, right wing climate denying weirdos. Mm -hmm. um, it would be better if it was the weirdos the weirdo. who, yeah, uh, want to have everyone housed and have us doing something to fight climate change. That's not what government's supposed to be about. <laughs> that's literally what people believe. I can't, yeah, that's yeah. insane to me. I mean, that, that's a lot. It, it, it's like, Taking for granted that the role of government is to make sure that no no business owner loses money operating the city or something. That's yeah, that's some people's mm -hmm. philosophy of government. That's yeah. literally what they believe. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been fun. It's been a year and a half of Channel 71 News. Uh moving into our fourth uh city council session. I'm uh excited to continue doing this. Uh, I mean our videos uh are getting more popular every single time we upload them. So more people are watching this uh, than ever before. I know a lot of people that don't even agree with us watch our show, which is hilarious. This goes to show that like, there's so little news coverage going on in the city of Waltham. Uh, it is so hard to find out what's going on in the city. It's so hard to find out what's going on in the city government. And our, you know, you know, like I like to think I put a lot of effort into this, but it could be, there could be a lot more effort into it. Um, 
but you know a lot of people still watch this uh excited to expand on it excited to do more uh and excited to continue working with both of you a lot of city government is sort of Feel, feels very unapproachable, and I think the problem this project has been us trying to make it more approachable. So yeah. I'm glad that people are watching. Okay, we'll see you in August. Thank you. Bye, guys. See ya.